the news were saying that you almost died. I, I, I really actually did. I was jumping in and out of the tank, and then like pretty suddenly I just couldn't really catch my breath. I couldn't really breathe, and it was a really crazy feeling. I had never felt that. Um, and then it kind of was getting worse and worse, and then I started panicking like, oh, my God, I think my throat's closing up. And they were really quick to rush me into the medic, and they, like, stabbed me with adrenaline, epinephrine, and, like, gave me a double dose of it. And within a few minutes, I was kind of back to normal. But, like, it was really scary for a second. I, like, couldn't breathe. And then when I did come to, I, like, projectile vomited, which is a thing. It was like The Exorcist. Sick. It was pretty sick. So you're not going to do one of those shows again? Honestly, I, I probably would. <laughs> I am your host, always here with us is Danny Cash, two-time Olympic silver medalist and my partner in crime. That's right. Lots of crime. Brittany Palmer, <laughs> our resident, and now she's got her logos on the, it's on, it's on the mat. Brittany's I in. I'm in. Our That's resident official. UFC uh, ring girl. And then today, our guest, Gus Kenworthy. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks. Let's go crazy. Um, 31 years of age from Telluride, um, Olympic silver medalist in 2014, five X Games medals, and 32 X Games competition starts. Um, you hold the record for the most X, uh, X Games appearances ever. I know. It actually it makes the five medals seem really bad when you compare it to 32 starts. I don't uh, think so. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, it's something that happens over time. How old were you was when you went? How old were you when you first competed? Negative one. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the, the reason there's 32 starts is because I compete in half pipe, slope style, and big air. Yeah. And uh, at one point in time, when I was competing, there was like three X Games each year because there was X Games Aspen, and then they would do uh, teens in France, and then they would have Oslo in Norway, and so. It kind of they added up pretty quickly. Right. What was your um? What was your er, like the first Olympics you went to? You got a silver medal. Yeah. That was Russia. Yeah, that was 2014. It was actually the first Olympics that uh, free skiing, slope style, uh, or or slope style for snowboarding too was included in the game. So it was kind of like the inaugural event. I was part of the first ever Team USA, and we ended up sweeping the podium. So it was it was like. It was honestly pretty iconic. I'm, I was very stoked on that, and it, it kind of like changed the trajectory of my whole life. Crazy, and that's so weird. Is when he just mentioned the sweep of the podium. Danny's yeah. first Olympic appearance was a podium sweep too. I know, and they told us that when we did ours, they were like, "It's the third time this has ever happened," and yours was the second. Yeah, it was pretty wild because I remember like you know you're so wrapped up in you know your own Olympic runs, and you're looking around and. I don't know if it was the same for you, but I remember being like, oh, you did really good, like, JJ. Oh, Ross, like, you killed it, too. And then someone's like, no, you guys really killed it. Yeah, it didn't register <laughs> for me, either. When I, uh, Joss Christensen, who won, was in first place after the first runs, I fell on my first runs. Nick Gepper, who got third, was in second place. And I, I had not registered that. And in watching back the run, the announcers are like, the opportunity for a podium steep sweep still exists. Like, this is Gus's last chance for a medal. But none of that was going through my head. I was just like, God, I need to land this fucking run. Yeah, yeah, you're right. right. I gotta do what I came here to do. And then I landed it and moved into second, and then I heard them announce it, and it was crazy. And, I mean, there there is, like, a sense of national pride for sure, and especially at the Olympics, but it's also kind of weird because, like, some of my best friends in the sport that I ski with, train with, compete with, travel with are from Canada or from New Zealand or whatever, so... Uh, like they're my teammates on Monster, they're my teammates on Atomic, but they're not my teammates for the U.S. And it's never, it's never really country based, and except for at the Olympics. The Olympics. Yeah, I mean, with all the flags, and you kind of really feel it. I mean, for us, I think it was like that the flag raising ceremony where you like were like, whoa, okay, this really is a big deal. Yeah, as a part of like your break above your just normal, you're like sitting on boxes in a podium setting. Totally. Um, and then in that run, though, I just wanted to touch on because if that you watch that video play a little bit more, you laced a hammer on that second or the last. The run. triple? Yeah. The, was it a cab triple? Yeah. What was yeah, that? yeah. 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 Switch cab triple fourteen forty, um, and that season was the first time that any of the skiers were doing triples in their runs. Like, I actually just to toot my own horn was the first guy to land a triple in a slope style event like a month prior at X Games. And a couple other guys did, and then, and then there was three of us or four of us at Olympics in Sochi that had triples in our runs. But it was still kind of early days for people putting it into a slope style run. So 
I felt like thrilled to land it. And I had sort of struggled on it in practice. I'd landed a few, I'd fallen on a lot of them. And that's the trick I fell on in my first run. So it was kind of like the entire second run, I was like, just get to the last jump, like just get yeah. to the last jump. And so everything else was like muscle memory. And then I got in and was just like, basically like hold on for dear life. Cause like I had opened up a little too early the run before. And so that run I held on and I, and then I just saw it. Like I saw the pocket where I was coming around, knew where I was going to land and just like came down really clean. So it was like, it was, I mean, it was really the best feeling, probably the best single feeling of my whole career trick wise. Wow. Oh, and if I that's remember so cool. the jumps there were big, they were huge. Yeah. That's like, that was the one thing I remember. A lot of people said that. Right? And I was texting Sage or McMorris or somebody and they're like, the jumps are fucking huge. And they I was really like, are. they look huge. <laughs> Like so, like people like on on training like they're like people were scared to like send the bottom jump. Oh no! I, the first day of practice, like normally at events, I mean, people will slide down the course and kind of check out the features for the first run. But sometimes they don't even do that. Uh, and then even still, like the second run, then you're hitting everything and you're kind of like pretty quickly starting to get into it and put together a run and think about what you're gonna do where. And on that course, like I feel like it was like more than half of the first day of practice, people weren't even hitting shit, just like looking yeah. at everything because it was huge and it was kind of like, okay, obviously I'm going to step up and hit this jump, but it's like, I don't know, you have to spin both ways and like you have to, so for me, I was like, oh, I have to, I'm going to do a switch right side double, which is kind of like spinning my opposite direction. Like what jump do I even want to do that? <laughs> on? Cause these are so big. Yeah. You were born in, in England, but made your way to Telluride. How old were you guys when you made the move out here? Um, I was three. I was um, the youngest of three brothers. So my next older brother's three years older. My oldest brother's nine years older. Um, and it was really random that we moved there. I mean, my dad's from the States. My mom's British and just kind of like ended up in Colorado. And no one in my family had skied before. We weren't like a big mountain family by any means, but kind of just like fell into it because that's what you do in a mountain town. Yeah. And then I think just because I was the youngest, I had the advantage of having two brothers that were like older, stronger. I was kind of always nipping at their heels. And then the friend group that I ended up making as a kid was super into skiing. And so it's like that kind of just shaped my life. But like had my friend group or my brothers been snowboarders, I probably would have been a snowboarder or like had we moved somewhere else, I, it would have been a different sport. It yeah. wasn't like, I don't know, it wasn't like predetermined or anything. Right. And not a bad place to grow up, Colorado. No, yeah, it's gorgeous. You know, the summertime, it's like one of those places. Mountain towns, I always say, like, yeah, the winter is what we're there for. But in the summertime, mountain towns are like, it doesn't get any better. Like, Mammoth in the summertime is so sick. I mean, all of them are pretty special, right? Like Warren yeah. Miller and said, I think uh, to live your best life, you should spend at least one winter of your life in a mountain town or one year. But Telluride's super special, right? I mean, it's definitely got its own kind of ancient mining time mining town kind of vibe yeah i feel like it's like it's not that it's the only one by any means but i feel like it's one of the few uh ski towns that's kind of like stayed true to its roots um i feel like a lot of the other ones have become super commercialized and like like i absolutely love aspen but like you go into aspen and you're walking around and it's like Gucci, Montclair, Prada, Lululemon. It's like all. He's just naming us what we're wearing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. I was talking about my outfit. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't like that town. <laughs> no, but it's like, it's, it's, it's like, it's almost like you're on like Rodeo Drive or something. Uh, you're 100% correct. But you're in Aspen. Yeah. You Whereas Telluride, it's like, it's, it's like a, a really rustic mining town. It still feels like that. It's like got the old facades on all the buildings that they were as. It was built and it's also so remote that it's hard as hell to get to and it kind of keeps people out. So like the busiest day at Telluride, the lift lines are shorter than like a regular weekday at Breckenridge. You know what's mm. crazy is I've still never been there and when I moved to America, I did Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club and then all the Breckenridge stuff, Aspen, we've been going for 20 years now. I've never been to Telluride and I, I, I need to I need to get there and now we were having the before you're a big part of the Telluride Gay Ski Week. Yeah. Um which is which is awesome and uh explain to us a little bit about the pro like you said you're you've kind of you, you've made a bit of put put kind of the flag back in the ground and you're you're getting more involved with that, yeah? Yeah, I mean it's been going on for a long time and a lot of resorts do Gay Ski Weeks. Aspen's one of the biggest most well-known ones, but like Whistler does one, Mammoth does one, Park City does one. And they're all super fun. They all kind of have slightly different vibes, but it's basically the same thing. It's getting gay people and queer people out to the slopes. It's actually kind of like a pretty popular thing for gay people to do. And it's, so it's like it kind of 
it combines like a ski vacation and like a fun party. And in normal situation, if you go to a ski town and you're gay, there's not going to be a lot of other gays. It's like, yeah, typically I feel like gay people in smaller, more rural places in ski towns, even if they love skiing, oftentimes want to be around kind of like our, our tribe. And so I feel like you end up getting uh, a lot of gay people that move to like LA, San Francisco, yeah. New York, Chicago. Um, and so there's like a really vibrant gay culture in those cities. And then in some of the smaller towns, it's like you're the one gay in the village. So this is kind of a fun time where you yep. get a lot of gay people, a lot of like-minded people in a place and everyone gets to enjoy skiing and party and hang out. It's really fun. And I just went back to Telluride Gay Ski Week this last season and it was like so much fun. It was one of the best weeks of my life. Brought a bunch of friends. It was super fun to ski, super fun to party, met a lot of cool people. And so I was like, I want to do this every year. And I've kind of like made that a plan now. So I'm going to continue going to Telluride Gay Ski Week. And I'm trying to talk to them about how I could like be involved in a bigger capacity, yeah. be a part owner, something like that. But I definitely want to make it a bigger thing. So yeah, awesome. listen in. Telluride I would Gay Ski uh, week. definitely attest to how fun it is because I've definitely seen where X Games and Aspen Gay Ski Week can overlap where I'm like, Normally, like, we're the ones partying, having a lot of fun, just like the whole X Games They're crowd. raging. Yeah. And when they do it combined, it's like Gay Ski Week takes over, and they're having so much more fun than we are. So <laughs> if you're around, like, it's just something to see because it really, like, you know, paints the town in a different way, you know? Totally. What's yeah. the vibe on the slopes, though? Because, I mean, I when I lived in L.A., I lived in West Hollywood. Like, I get the vibe. Like, do they dress up? Is it, like, do they, like, do the whole pride vibe on the hill i mean i think it's the same as anywhere it's like yeah. you, you, you get all of it there's certainly people that are like wearing like rainbow colored jumpsuits and going sure. skiing and i think that that's like celebrated and everything but like i am still wearing my same shit that i would compete at x games in and it's like a black hoodie and <laughs> black snow pants and like a monster helmet it's sure. like uh so i feel like it kind of runs the whole gamut but i think there's definitely a little bit more of that yeah um but and the yeah. dance that would vibe. Be so fun. The yeah. dance vibe in all yeah. the bars and clubs and yeah, hotel always lounges. Always good music. Like, really steps up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, between uh, Sochi and the Korea Olympics, South Korea. Yeah, Pyeongchang. That was the actual change of, well, not change, but that was when you, but that you came out in between that, right? Yeah. Being in Russia, that must have been a little weird for you. It not was, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously knew I was gay. I knew I was gay when I was really young, but I was in a small town. Like I was just saying, there weren't a lot of other gay people. I didn't have a lot of uh, connections and like like-minded people or anyone to even really talk about it with. And so it was kind of hard because like I knew I was gay, but I also didn't because I didn't really know any gay people and like I hadn't like hooked up with a guy or anything like that. Yeah. So I just was like, I just feel different. I don't really know what's up with me. Um and then, uh, I, I, I mean, I wanted to, to be a pro skier. I wanted to do all this. And then when it kind of took off for me, I, I sort of said like, oh, I guess I'm putting this on a back burner. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As I slapped the mic. Um, I guess I'm putting <laughs> this on the back burner. Your mic, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> did, uh, did like the Russia Olympics have any like kind of like help with it? Because I remember watching the media over there and it was like Russia was getting a lot of flack from being like, anti-gay, anti, -gay, anti yeah. a lot of like certain human yeah, I mean, rights. Right, right before the games, they basically introduced a whole propaganda law and said that anyone that was out, that was promoting homosexuality, promoting the LGBT agenda would be subject to the same laws, persecution, punishment as people in Russia were. And so like the U.S. team basically like warned us and was like, we're not saying anybody's gay. We're not asking if anybody's gay, but heads up, if you go there, if you have any sort of public demonstration of every anything you could risk being thrown in jail and so like we're advising against it and i wasn't even out but i remember being kind of like fuck this like this is bullshit yeah right yeah. Um, so but, I, would, I, but i was like scared. i'm gonna take I, my triple and fucking stomp <laughs> yeah. this thing down well actually i mean i literally had it in my mind that i was gonna come out there like i i had i was like i i couldn't believe everything that was going on and i was like you know what i'm gonna like land this run the best run i've ever done and like win or get a medal or whatever and then i'm gonna like be like yeah i'm gay and just be like <laughs> kind of like mic drop 
And yeah, then, of course, <laughs> you're like, hey, uh, also, I just did a cab triple. Yeah. So there it is. You phoned it in on the airplane? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that was like kind of that was like kind of in my head that that's what I was going to do. And then I landed the run. I did it. And I kind of just like froze. And at that time, I hadn't told my mom. I hadn't told my brothers. I hadn't told any of my best friends. Like I was like deeply in the closet. So I, I think I just kind of got scared to and was like, I, I, I'm not ready. Um, but it, it, it got the ball rolling for me. I was like, OK, I do want to take that step. And then that following like, well, the following year is when it really happened. But that following press tour after the Olympics, like you go on all these like talk shows and late night shows. And our event was on February 13th, and February 14th is Valentine's Day, and it was a sweep of the podium. And they were like, oh, we've got these three, like, cute American guys that just swept the podium, and you're all young bachelors. And, like, what's your dream girl? What's your dream date? Who's your celebrity crush? And I was kind of like, shit, I have been avoiding these questions. I've been, like, dodging questions. I've been lying by omission. I've been, like, hooking up with girls at events to try and keep up this facade. But now I'm, like lying on TV in yeah. an interview everyone's going to see it and i remember like hating myself and so the entire tour all the media everything we did after that like it was like maybe the lowest i've ever been i i kept being like i can't believe i have to wake up tomorrow and like keep lying but i also was like but i'm i don't want to like change my whole life by coming out on like the today show just because I don't want to lie. And like, I haven't told my mom and I feel like that conversation should be had in person. And so I, I was just like it, it, internally like about to explode. And then kind of shortly after I was like, you know what, I am going to come out. And initially I was like, I'm going to quit skiing. I'm going to quit skiing and come out. I want to live my truth. I just got an Olympic medal. I've had X games medals. I've had do tour wins, all these things. I've done what I needed to do. So I'm going to come out. And then like in talking with uh, my, my, ski agent and my friend Justin who was actually the one narrating that video who became my coach uh it was kind of like you should just come out and keep skiing and I like hadn't ever I know it's so crazy but I hadn't ever thought about that because there had not been anybody in any action sport it wasn't even just skiing it was snowboarding skateboarding moto BMX surfing mountain biking like any of the sports no one had been gay and so I was like I'm gonna come out and then sponsors are gonna be like yeah, we are done. Like, it's all based on image. It's based on your following. I was like, I'm not going to have sponsors. I'm not going to have income. I'm going to get judged poorly. And it's so crazy, but that's like really what I thought. Wow. And then I kind of was like, well, whatever. If that's what happens, that's what happens. But I want to like live my truth and and, yeah. and tell my story. And so I, I came out and then it was kind of like the opposite. <laughs> like, all my brands were like, we're really stoked for you. And like, it's really cool. And it's like kind of brings a diverse angle to this brand that there's not a lot of diversity in this sport. And we would love to like continue supporting you and telling your story. And like Monster was super supportive, and all the sponsors that I had were super supportive. And then I ended up opening the door for new sponsors. And when I went into the 2018 Olympics, like three years later, uh, I, I was like one of the, the more decorated athletes at the entire games yep. because there was a lot of brands that wanted to tell that story and yeah. wanted to partner with me and show support. Yeah, the media really kind of like took took onto that. Um, and then also during that that Olympics, and you said you you. The, the the puppies were the thing that would led the media, I think, in the South Korea. But you said you actually started that in Russia. No, actually, yeah, the the the, the puppies actually it was in Russia. In addition to this, like anti LGBT propaganda that they had been pushing, they also were like rounding up and euthanizing all these stray dogs because they they said before the games that like it would ruin the image of the Russia games if a dog was to like walk out into an event, which is insane to me. It's like that's like cute and like the internet loves it's that crazy. <laughs> i mean and the thing when you say like stray dogs like they paint them in this bad picture but these are like really cute dogs they're so cute and they're so sweet and like docile and like aren't even getting in your way but they were doing that and i was super like hurt by it and and i didn't know i, I didn't like have plans going in to be like i'm gonna do something about this but i just like ended up finding these dogs and falling in love with them and i was seeing a guy at the time totally in the closet and he was over there doing like some media press stuff. And so he and I kind of just like decided that we were going to bring these dogs back to the States and like couldn't allow these dogs to get hurt. And it took off like wildfire. Like the media heard about it and like it was all like they cared way more about that than the metal, which fair enough. But like all the interview, all the interviews I was doing afterward were like, what's going on with the dogs? And, 
and, and also yeah. it was hard because like this guy I was seeing was helping out a lot, but it's like I didn't even know how to like credit him without sort of like outing the fact that we were together and he was in the closet too. And then the other question in the interviews was like, who's your celebrity crush? Who's your dream girl? And I, so I was just like struggling through that whole media thing. But the Humane Society International helped with that. They brought the dogs back. Like one of those dogs is my mom's dog still to this day. Two of them live with my ex, um, that guy. Um, but it, 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 it like was a thing and, and, and the Humane Society International was like super grateful for the exposure and I was super grateful to them for helping with yeah. the actual like process of bringing the dogs back. And so then in 2018, they were like, hey, we would love to have you lend your voice to a PSA because there are these dog meat farms that are really close to the athlete village in Korea. And they basically are super inhumane. One of the ways that they kill these dogs to eat them is like throwing them into boiling vats of oil, like, <clears throat> like live. It's so disgusting. Oh. And they're kept in really inhumane conditions in these horrible cages in the cold. It's freezing outside. They're shivering. They're standing on like cage floors. It's, it's just horrible. Um, and, I, and I was like, of course, I'll do whatever I can to help you guys. I'd be happy to go to a farm and lend my voice to a PSA. And I did that, and then the day we were at the farm, one of the dogs that was in this cage, like shivering uncontrollably, gave birth while we were standing there. And so that's my dog, Birdie. He's one of the puppies. Oh, oh <laughs> wow. And I mean, you, I mean, it pretty much like snowballed out, right? Where, I don't know, how many athletes do you think came home with dogs from uh, Korea? Well, I, I, I actually don't even know how many came back from Korea, but I do know that there, there, it, it did kind of like, compound and more and more people did that but that particular farm that i was at humane society international shut down and so 90 dogs from that farm got brought back to the u.s wow. and canada and they all found forever homes wow Aww. good for that's you. insane you, man wow. that's so rad it's Pretty crazy because cool. i remember when we were there for the tv show danny wanted to bring a dog home and they wouldn't they wouldn't let us film remember the street dog do you remember that uh, kind of. I do. He got emotional black, about it. You don't really remember it, huh? No. He's not so emotional now. He no. got. He got. He got. He, he, he like because we were filming the show, and then there was this puppy, and he came back, and he's like, "We've got to take this dog." Yeah. And then they come back with the camera with our cameras, and then the lady like freaks out, and then Danny kept trying to go back and get the dog. That was uh, anyway. That was that was a crazy trip for us in general, but that's that's uh, really awesome what you did there, and then to create that snowball effect. But yeah, crazy, right? To go to the Olympics and then to. Become home the puppy master. <laughs> I know it's kind of it is crazy. I didn't win a medal though, so it was like nice to not be totally empty-handed. <laughs> I heard that I, I I heard that it was it, yeah, that it was tough conditions there. That, it really was. I mean, like everyone worried that Sochi was going to be because there was no snow, and I think that the half pipe definitely suffered there because of it. But like the slope style course in Sochi was phenomenal, um, and the conditions that we had, the weather was great, so it ended up being fine. In Pyeongchang, it was so insanely cold that like it, there was spots where it wasn't even white, where it was snow. It was almost like blue because it was like ice and you could see through it. And so like you'd come down on the landings and it was like you could hear it smacking. Schmack. Um, it was brutal. And I had a I had a fall in practice and got this because it's like so rock solid. I got this huge hematoma on my hip. It was like it looked like I had like Kim Kardashian's implants and like <laughs> they had to drain my Which hip. Which ones? Whoa. Uh, the, 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 the ass, the ass. And they had to drain it from the side of my hip and it was like all these like wow. insane amounts of no fluid way. that came out of it. So gross. Um, but I was like hobbling and then I was still made it through to the final and like was so uh, on a course to, in my mind, like still landing around and getting a medal and then I just couldn't put it down in the final. I was like in pain, it was cold and I mean excuses, excuses, but it just didn't quite put it down. So it was like pretty tough walking away. But you competed for Great Britain at the last one. The third time around, yeah. The third the third time around. What was the decision on that? I mean, there was a lot of factors into it for sure. Uh one of them was just that it would be an easier qualifying process and GB, I mean, like, there was a lot of people that pushed back against it and were like, you're taking a spot away from someone else. But it's actually like, mm, I'm, I'm really not. I still have to earn that spot for GB. And if someone else earns a spot, then GP will send two people. Yeah. But, like, they ended up only sending uh, one for, for men for half pipe. And it was mine. It wasn't because someone else earned it and I took it. It was because I earned it. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, it it was kind of like a measured decision. There was a lot of different things. I mean, I wanted to do it to honor my mom, and she's been my number one fan, my number one supporter. Um, 
and I knew it was going to be my last game. It was my last time competing. She used to take me to competitions like in towns hours away from where I grew up, and and we grew up on like a really fixed income in affordable housing. And she like I don't know did whatever she could yeah. to to make ends meet and did so much for me. And so I kind of just like wanted to do it in her honor. Um, but then of course I was also like, well, and it's also going to be an easier process. Yeah. I, mean, I still have to qualify for the Olympics, but I'm not fighting for four spots against 10 dudes she that are the best in the world. I'm like fighting against all the other countries to earn a spot for my country and know that if I do that, I'll go. You know what I, how I look at it? I kind of look at it the other way. You're giving it a spot up to somebody that more deservingly probably should be there by giving America an extra spot. It's kind of, it's kind of true. I mean, I don't know if I would have gotten one of the U.S. spots that year because as the qualifications got closer, I had a, kind of an insane series of events, but I had a, a really bad concussion at a training camp in October, and it was like my third completely knocked out, KO'd concussion in a year, and I got COVID while I was recovering, and I was having all these long COVID symptoms, and they didn't know if it was long COVID or a concussion because the symptoms are pretty similar, but it was like memory loss, brain fit fog, like an inability to find my words, balance issues. And so I, I ended up like not even skiing November or December until like early January of the Olympic year and missed all that training and then was kind of coming back and like finding my footing and would get really exhausted. And so it was kind of like a, a bit of a struggle. And, and that's the qualifying period for the US. Yep. So in actuality, I'm so grateful that I did it for GB. They were super supportive. I was so happy to do it for my mom, but like I, I wouldn't have made it for the US yeah. because of all of that. Um, but assuming I had been healthy, yeah, I, I think I would have been in the running for one of those spots. And so it kind of frees up a spot for a U.S. guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, and then obviously like, you know, in these type of sports, like going into your third Olympics, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a little bit more difficult. Yeah. She's old, uh, <laughs> and she feels it. <laughs> uh, I've, had, I've had a lot of surgeries. I've had a lot of broken bones. I've blown my knee I've had so many concussions and when you're 18 it's kind of like you're fine like I remember breaking my collarbone and having a plate and nine screws put in and I was skiing like a week and a half later like it's fully broken but I was like well there's hardware in there it's not going anywhere yeah and now I'm like 31 and I'm like I am gonna watch Netflix for a week <laughs> yep I like um, that so wait just to before we move on when you say like the teams because you were really doing qualifying for more than one team right so you're doing slope style and yeah half pipe. and so that was also that was part of the uh reason that i initially switched was like the u.s is so competitive but because the u.s puts their qualifying process at the very very end right before the games to try and have the strongest team in that exact moment the previous two olympics i was on double duty like competing like there would be a world cup and it would be like slope styles this morning and while slope style competition's happening, the half pipe practice is going on. And so I was like missing a practice because I was competing and then I'd have to go to the pipe and and I hadn't gotten as much training as everyone else had. And so it kind of like, it, it almost like didn't feel totally fair. And I remember trying to talk to the team about it and they were like, well, we can't give you your own practices. That's not fair. And I was like, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, I don't want my own practices, but it's also not fair that I don't get the same amount of yeah. practices as someone else because I'm doing another event. And so it was just like I was constantly catching up and I would get like wrecked on a fall in pipe and then the next morning have to compete in slope whereas everyone else that was doing pipe would have like four days off. And so it just kind of was like taking a toll on my body. And part of that was like, if I go to GB, I could earn my spot a year out and not have to do that. And I had just put myself through the ringer the previous two times. And in 2014, I earned a spot in pipe, earned a spot in slope. They told me I had the spot. And then just before the games, they did a coach's discretion and took my pipe spot and gave it to someone else. And so it was kind of just devastating because I had done all those qualifying events. I had got the two podiums. I had earned the spot. And then someone who was super deserving um, but had been hurt during the qualifying things and was going to be healthy for the games, they felt like was a better medal favorite. And so they took my spot and gave it to him, and I just had to like be okay with that. And it was... It was really tough. That would have really chapped my heart. Shit. Yeah. American Horror Story, me and Kelly used to watch it every season. It was like our thing. And then the next thing, the season comes up, and I'm like, see the commercial, and I'm like, that's no fucking way. <laughs> and it was a good season. I was like, oh, he's probably only going to be in a, like a little bit. He's in the whole fucking season. 
How did you, did you, did you acting, um, did you, when, when did you start? Like, was there coaching? Was there like the, the idea of like, all right, like I'm going to start dabbling in different things here and see where this kind of takes me? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of always, while I was skiing, thought about the fact that like it wouldn't be forever and I didn't want to get to the end of my rope and then be like, shit, now what do I do? Um, which is literally where I am right now. So didn't, didn't solve anything. Um, but I, I had always kind of thought that acting was something that I wanted to do. I had done some theater when I was a kid, but I'm like, it's a super small town where I grew up. And so the theater program is not uh, particularly competitive. It's like, oh, you want to be in the play? Cool. You're in the play. There's no parts. Okay. You're a tree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, I wanted to act, but I, I had certainly ha didn't have a ton of experience. Uh, I didn't, I didn't go to college. I wasn't in a theater department, anything like that. But my ex of a bunch of years is an actor and is super talented and hardworking. And I would often like help him with sides, learning lines, running lines, putting him on tape for auditions. And I kind of just like fell in love with the craft through him and watching him work on it. And then I kind of mentioned to him that it was something I'd be interested in pursuing and he was super supportive. And so I kind of just like started auditioning and trying to use whatever connections I had and things that I had made through skiing and through sponsorships and anything to try and get a foot in the door. And then after the 2018 Olympics, like kind of randomly had the chance to to cross paths with Ryan Murphy. And he was so, so sweet when I met him and was like very complimentary and, and basically just said like, it was so amazing to watch you at the Olympics and, and have a, a gay person competing on the world stage. And, and, and like you did us proud and it, it really hit home for me in a, in a big way. Cause I was like, I mean, I, you're, you're Ryan Murphy. Like I'm obsessed with you. I'm yeah. obsessed with American horror story and, um, like pose. And he's just done so much for the community. Um, and I, and I had told him that I was interested in acting and he was like, Oh, well, we'll have to, we'll have to find something for you. We'll have you read for something. And then a few months later, I kind of was like, okay, sure. And then a few months later he, he was like, Hey, there's a part on horror story that I think you'd be good for if you want to like audition for it. And then I, did and then he was like amazing yeah like followed up and was like yeah the part's yours and I still didn't know how big the part was gonna be um because like with sides you you, only, you get like a scene that you're especially a, especially a show like that where everyone gets murdered yeah everyone gets killed <laughs> off and so I didn't I didn't I didn't know yeah. and even when we started filming actually like I I had gotten the first few episodes and then like the third episode hadn't even been written I hadn't even read it so I I sort of never knew I was like I don't I don't know if I'm gonna be gone in the next episode. And then was on for the whole season. It was really crazy. Crazy, what a cool, what a what a crazy experience <laughs> it was for sure. And it also like for me, it solidified that I was like, oh, I really do want to be doing this. Like I had so much fun being on set. I yeah. loved being in hair and makeup, and I loved the whole process. And God, I'm so gay. I'm like, I love being in hair and makeup. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really did like I like loved the makeup artists and like all these people that I met and the connections and my co-stars and it was so fun to get to see the process of a TV show coming together from the writing to actually being on set to rehearsing it to blocking it and then to shooting it and then with that show it's like a really quick turnaround from when you film it to when it's on TV so like oh it is yeah it's insane when we when we filmed the ninth episode the eighth episode aired <laughs> Whoa. It's like wow. live. It's basically yeah. live. They're turning it around so fast. <laughs> wow. It's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. You uh, you were recently in a movie with uh, a friend of ours, Eddie for Brady, and uh, Gron Gronkowski's a Monster Energy guy, so we've got to know him pretty well. And and uh, um, you know, it's uh, it's funny. Like when we first took Danny to his house, we we're in the house, and Danny's like walking around Gronk's apartment, and Danny's like. Is Gronk? Is, I was like, he's like a big kid. And Danny's like, okay. <laughs> no, literally, it was like the movie Big. It was like, it was like so you have a like trampoline in, in your living room? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that's what I would do if I was you too. <laughs> did, um, did, uh, uh, so I, I watched the movie. You're in it. You play a reporter. Did you get to hang with, was Gronk on set when you were there? No, he wasn't. I, my scene was with the, the four women, I, I, Sally Field, Rita Moreno. Um, all of them. It was amazing. Um, superstars, like superstars, really like funny, icons. really funny concept. Yeah, and really done, done really well. Yeah, uh, I mean, my part. I actually, I wasn't even actually a reporter. I was a, like a party goer. We were in line to go into a party, and oh, okay, my part is it it's it's super super small. If you uh, are watching the movie, don't blink because you'll miss it. Um, 
but it was still very, very cool to, to be there and to be on set with them and to meet those women and to get to go to the premiere. Uh, it was it was awesome. That's cool. I actually just started watching that movie on an airplane last night. I haven't got to your part yet. I or, just or you I blanked. just passed the the Guy Fieri part. I'm still in. The oh beginning. yeah, it's just after that. Okay, cool. And then you did not acting, but it was real life. The Survivor, the TV show. Yeah, the, it wasn't Survivor. Oh my it, god, that's it, my favorite show. Uh, it was. Uh, it was it was the, called uh, Special Forces. Special Forces, the challenge. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was fun. It was it it, it well, it wasn't actually was fun. It was fun. It, yeah. was, it was horrible. It was like literally not fun at all. Because um, <laughs> Danny was reading something this morning, and he's like, "Wait, what?" Yeah, I, was like, I mean, Gus like Danny Amendola died. was Dingo, on my did you read this? What's that? It's uh, the news. were saying that you almost died. I I I really actually did. Um, but yeah, at the at the end of the show, we still don't really know what was happening. But I was basically doing this like hazing punishment where I had to repetitively get in and out of this like dunk tank, which was basically like sitting stagnant water and everyone on the cast that had to get into the water on day one and like mud and sand and debris had all gotten in the water and then it had been sitting there for nine days at this point with like 120 degree weather it's like boiling yeah, in the sun you? and there was like algae and all sorts of like tadpoles and gross stuff swimming in it that I saw and I don't know if I ingested some of that water when I jumped in or like it went in my nose or what happened but I was jumping in and out of the tank and then like pretty suddenly I just couldn't really catch my breath. I couldn't really breathe. And it was a really crazy feeling. I had never felt that. Um, and then it kind of was getting worse and worse. And then I started panicking like, oh my God, I think my throat's closing up. And they were really quick to rush me into the medic and they like stabbed me with adrenaline, epinephrine and like gave me a double dose of it. And within a few minutes I was kind of back to normal, but like it was really scary for a second. I like couldn't breathe. And then when I did come to, I like projectile vomited which is a thing it was like the exorcist sick. it was pretty sick um <laughs> and uh and then i and then i was kind of fine and 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 like five minutes after the shot had been administered i actually felt okay and was like okay i like want to go back in and they basically were like we can't send you back in one there's a risk of repeat anaphylaxis but two we're not even sure what caused it like we don't know if it's something that you ate earlier if it was the dunk tank if you got stung by something and they're like so we can't risk like bringing you back into the environment to finish the course wow where was that filmed it was in jordan in the wadi rum desert okay, wait wow. like the country jordan yeah hmm interesting yeah so you're not going to do one of those shows again honestly i i probably would <laughs> it it was it was an experience um also, like, it wasn't a show where you were competing for money or something like Survivor. It was just, like, everyone signed on to do it and got paid to do it. Um, and I like money, so I would probably do it again. Yeah. <laughs> what about Naked and Afraid? Would you do that? Um, no. I'm, I don't think so. Would I, you do that? I don't know. I would. I've watched a lot of episodes. <laughs> It, um, I, I actually have to. It's a crazy show. I mean, I, I feel mind. like it'd be really hard to get comfortable. Like, obviously, when you watch it on TV, it's all blurred out, so it's like not a big deal. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, you'd, you'd get used to it, right? You'd be like, you oh, would. That's, that's the craziest thing. I would thing. do. So if, I did. Uh, I did the body issue for ESPN mm -hmm. in 2016, and I mean, like skiing and being in the snow is not like a particularly flattering place for a guy to be naked. Um, but it made it like very easy for like hiding yourself and like getting in positions where nothing was visible. I was like, oh, it, I mean, girl, it's gone. Like it's like I, it, I'm freezing cold on the Mammoth Mountain. It's like windy as hell. Um, but it was like I, I remember like the first time I stripped naked and was in front of a whole room, like 20 people that are like Watching light and, people, yeah. photographers, all these people. And like they're fully dressed and bundled up and I'm like shivering and naked. I was so so deeply uncomfortable You're right. and then within like I don't know 10 15 minutes you kind of are just over it you're like this is what it is and the shoot was hours long and like I was hitting a jump and doing all this stuff and suddenly you're you're kind of comfortable with it so you I feel like in regard to that show like I'm naked. sure the first you're gonna jump naked half an hour yeah what get out of here yeah did like a naked, rodeo naked? did a rodeo naked <laughs> I love that you call it a rodeo too yeah Glo gloves on people no, no gloves. <laughs> no yeah. gloves? gloves? I wouldn't gloves. count the gloves as, like, clothing. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't do it. No gloves, no helmet, no goggles, just, like... Just boots. Boots. Wow. Boots. <laughs> That's that. fucking awesome. Yeah. Um, we're going to go over to... We're going to talk about uh, the Worthy Foundation.
Yeah. So you've started a nonprofit 501c3, and um, let's let's what is it? Uh, it's it's I mean it's it's basically a transfer organization, but I was doing a lot of corporate partnerships and things with brands, and a lot of them were around pride, and they would be like, hey, we want to pay you to come and speak at our thing, or we want to do this, and I kind of started to be like, well. I want to fundraise, I want to be giving back, and so I would talk to the brands, talk to the partnerships, and be like, will you, uh, instead of paying me this, pay me this, but then donate some money to the Worthy Foundation. And so I started being able to accumulate money and then was able to make more con- uh, more sort of like generous contributions yeah. and, and, and more meaningful and impactful contributions. And in 2019, I did the AIDS life cycle, which is... Uh, a fundraiser, but it's a bike ride from San Francisco to LA. It takes five days. Dang. And it's like 500 miles. And you get people to basically like donate that they're supporting your ride. If you do the ride, they donate. And uh, that year I raised the most money that anybody ever has in like the 20 years that they've done the ride. I raised over a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. And was like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm capable of fundraising. People w- will support me. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this ride every single year because it's a lot of work. Did you do it. Big Sur? Like, did you go along the... We didn't. We went inland there because the road's really it's dangerous gnarly. there. So, I nearly fell off so, a cliff there. So we started, then you go inland, then you go back to the coast and finish on the PCH. Um, but I was like, I don't know if I want to do this ride every year, but I do want to fundraise every year. And so started the Worthy Foundation. And like this June, we're going to be donating like, Fifty thousand dollars to a couple of different cool. LGBTQ charities. Awesome! Congratulations, that's Thanks. huge. Did you stay at the Madonna Inn? No, we were sleeping like tents. <laughs> I've never stayed at the Madonna Inn. I want to. You I, would love the Madonna I know. Inn. It's iconic. I need to. I've stayed there a bunch. Our friends, uh, our friend uh, that uh, Janae's family is, uh, they run it. Oh, that's right. That's I've up by Tulsum and Ranch. Yeah. It's like when all of the rooms are different, right? Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. The, yeah. Me and my mom stayed in the room that had uh, like had like uh, the no. the shower was just like ro- the shower was uh, uh, like a, in a rock bed, and the water came from mm-hmm. everywhere, and then there was like lions like out in the room. Insane. <laughs> um, that's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. That's a big feat. I think a lot of people. Um, you know, I think a lot of people want to do good in the world, and 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 being able to give back is one of those things that, like, when you do it, it 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 it, it, it you go to bed that you feel so good. It's true. You know, it's 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 almost like a drug, for sure. I, and and I think it's it's that step that a lot of people wish they could take, but they don't. You know, sometimes know how or what, what to do. But congratulations on that because it's, it's it's not easy to do those type of things. No, I mean, I appreciate. it. I feel like I I. Could do more, should do more, but I, I, it does feel good to do something, and I feel like for anybody like listening, it, it doesn't have to be something huge, even like just like volunteering in your neighborhood, something super small, local. You still get that same feeling, and like I don't know, I feel like I have an elevated platform and and a following and whatever, and so I, I just kind of like want to utilize that for good instead of using it yeah. only for so like selfish stuff, which I which I do too, but yep. So, um, are you? Officially retired from skiing? Is it you're done? I am. Yeah. I mean, I'm done. I'm retired from competing. I'm, right. Right. I'm, yeah. 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 I'm yeah. still skiing. Um, but it's 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 in like different capacities. I mean, I'm, I'm I've partnered with the Telluride Gay Ski Week, and I want to do more in that capacity and help. I, it's kind of more like from like a promoter event standpoint. But I would like to still do some shoots and uh, film video part maybe. But this last season, I I wasn't on snow very much. I took like a long break. My body was wrecked after the Olympics and pushing through like the brain injuries that I had and all the things to try and still compete. I was like overdue for some time off. So this winter I was kind of away from the snow more than I've ever been for sure. And then next season I'd like to get back to it a bit, but in a different way, in a different way. So wait, what, let's talk about that though. Cause I mean, the next Olympics are going to be one of the best ones in she's probably like 20 years. Why, in why it, that? Well, because they're in Italy, it's like, you know, almost uh, an You easier... trying to talk Gus back into going to the next Olympics? Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> one out of a million, what are the chances you'd come back for Cortina 2026? I mean, one in a million? I think I would say, like, just in terms of percentage, I feel like there's, like, a, like, 10, 15% chance. If, if I, like, I feel like, I, I mean, I, I'm auditioning, I'm writing, I'm working to try and make a career happen in entertainment in a different way. And I feel like if it goes the way I hope it will or think it could, then probably not. I don't think I would like then leave that to go back to this. But if I'm still grinding and it hasn't really happened yet 
and I am looking over at the ski side of things, and I feel like the runs haven't progressed, progressed to a certain so level so much yep. that I could never catch up. There's a world in which I think I could be like, you know what, maybe I would come out of retirement and, and get back to training and see if there's a way that I could get these runs under my belt, but I think it's pretty unlikely. All right, well, I, I mean, because I do work with the U.S. ski and snowboard team, so I wouldn't be doing my in. job. Just perfect. got named the head coach. Uh, oh, my God, yeah. congrats. I Thank actually didn't you. know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Snowboard half pipe. That's so rad. You know, and I got to work with Dave a little bit because he kind of showed up without his whole crew and sauce this year, which is pretty fun. Yeah. And I really didn't know much how to coach, but I'd be like, chest up, Dave, while you drop in. Keep <laughs> the chest up. But you know what? Gina drop. Carano, who was an MMA fighter, she... Same thing. She went on a, they they cre started creating movies for her around her skill set that she had already had. So now she always plays this like badass superhero because she can do her own stunts. I think something for you because you have this incredible skiing technique, like creating movies that can both like sh show that part of you and then the acting part. You know. I know. I've actually like had the idea. Like th there used to be such iconic ski movies that yeah. like Hot Dog and like. These movies that would be, uh, they were like, I, I don't know, like Someone's 80s gonna create a movie and for like for so sure. retro and, and, and funny with their storylines, but it would be fun to bring something like that back and get to yeah. to also ski and act in it. They're I like gonna that. They're going to create it. That's going to happen. Yeah. What injury tends to hurt the most? Uh, have you had any bad injuries? And um, uh, uh, what made? Well, we know what made him start his career, but w w what injuries have you had and what hurts the most? That's from Christy Crito. Uh, I have had so many. As I said, I've had a bunch of concussions. I've uh, broken my sternum. And uh, ribs are also pretty bad because anytime you laugh, cough, very painful, and there's not a whole lot that you can do about that. Um, I've broken my legs. I've blown my knee. But I would say that uh, my left knee, I, I broke off a bunch of the cartilage. I, d I did it on both knees, actually, and I had microfracture surgery on my right knee. And I didn't do it on my left because it was just before this last Olympics. And so I kind of just did a scope surgery. They cleaned it out. But I, I still sort of need a surgery. And there's a lot of clicking and popping that happens in that knee, um, especially like in the gym and when I'm lifting. So that is probably currently the most painful. And uh, at some point, I'll need to get a follow-up surgery. Right. It's crazy because it just kind of, you were pretty lucky in your career until the end, right? I mean, not really lucky, you know. I feel like you kind of choose a certain way, and when you get to that level of athlete, it's like you almost sell your body. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like, same thing with my left knee. Like, I did tibia plateau and ACL surgery in the same one, and... You just have these pains, and it's like, I don't know, I think it's... You just live with it. You live with it, right? Because you're chasing glory in this, like, achievement, and truthfully, your body is kind of like, you just wanted to get it to A to B, and then you deal with the pain or whatever later, you know? Yeah. It's crazy, too. I mean, people are like, aren't you so scared of getting hurt? And it's kind of like, I mean, as I've gotten older, yeah, I don't want to get hurt less and less, but, like... I'm kind of like, no, I've actually just fully accepted that I am going to get hurt. And it's like, I'll do all these things to try and reduce the risk and, and be as smart and calculated as possible. But ultimately, like, no, I'm going to I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to break shit. I'm going to have to deal with it. But what about like in the moment? Because I've had a few of them where you're like, think to yourself, you're like, OK, I'm really about to risk a lot right now. Like, is there anything that you kind of went through your mind where you like accepted the fate? Either and you may land it and ride away perfect, but you may know. Yeah, I mean, also it's like for me, like in training, I I sometimes would be like, oh, it's not worth this risk right now. Like if, whatever this trick is, like even though I have to train it, I have to try it, I have to work on it. Uh, like conditions are weird, or this jump's weird, or whatever. I'm not gonna do it. Uh, but then when you're at a contest, especially a high stakes one, if it's X Games, if it's Olympics, if it's the Do Tour, and it's kind of like, oh well, I guess like those factors change. It might be the same weather, it might be the same jump, but now the risk is worth it. Because like you want to do you it for win. the crowd, you want to do it for the victory. Because I feel the same way, like sometimes you watch some of these like backcountry parts, you're like, I don't know, I'm sure you've been out there where you're like, you know what, I really don't feel like doing this for just that guy holding the camera over there. Yeah. <laughs> but if there was like some young kids holding a sign with my name on it or even just like making noise, I would rather do it for that moment than like, the victory of the shot sometimes. You For know? sure, I feel, yeah. Did you ever have any pre-skiing like pre -skiing rituals or anything that you do? That was one of the questions on here. I tried not to. I, I sometimes would where like I would eat something or do something and then I'd like win that day and then I was like, oh God, I have to do this again because I, I, I'm like crazy and then I'd be like, that's, that's why or that must have played a factor into it. 
Mm. But then you kind of have to let that go. Otherwise, you're going to end up being so neurotic and going through these crazy motions and being so superstitious. Um, I had a shirt that I used to wear on contest days, and that was kind of like my only weird superstition. And then before I compete, it's mostly just like I would do like kind of short little meditations, just yeah. like breath work, try and get really present. And I would find that any time that I would screw up my runs, when I would fall on things especially that I – wasn't supposed to fall on things that weren't hard tricks in my run necessarily was when I was getting ahead of myself. I was thinking about like the podium or like what I would say in an interview afterward, like things that are so non-consequential and also not important in the moment and hadn't even happened yet. And it was just me not being present. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like just, I feel like breath work is like how you get back to the moment or how I did. Have you ever tried snowboarding? I have tried snowboarding. I'm okay. I can snowboard. Um, I hadn't done it in years, and then at Christmas this year when I went uh, on the mountain with family, they all skied, and I actually snowboarded because there wasn't a ton of terrain open, and I was like, oh, that'll be fun. And it was really fun, um, but it had been a long time. But I feel like I was, like, proficient or, like, better than an average person that snowboards, but not, like, I could, like, be a pro snowboarder by yeah. any means. But there's a skier, Burke Rude, who... Just just posted yeah. b triple on snowboard and skis. I saw that. I saw him do a dub. Back yeah, dub. he just did a triple, uh, back, back triple fourteen, on a snowboard, and then did it on skis on the same jump. Could he? It's could insane. he potentially compete in both? Because X Games is going to bring back qualifiers. Could somebody like that potentially go through the qualifying process to make like a big For arrow? Sure. I mean, he's, he's also uh, he's Norwegian, so I don't know what the team looks like on the other side. I know he's got like Marcus Cleveland. Like, there's obviously super competitive yeah. guys, but I don't know how many there are for Norway. Um, but I mean, he certainly could try. I don't know if he could make it. Yeah. But I mean, he's he's super. I mean, he's really one of the best skiers, jump skiers for sure period at the moment or maybe that there's ever been um and he obviously has the ability to switch it over to a snowboard so i feel like if if he was able to continue to work on it like maybe he could it'd be right. crazy one question i keep seeing coming in now uh is uh the celebrity crush did you ever answer that <laughs> i did i said miley cyrus and the other two guys said uh taylor swift and emma watson and NBC Olympics like tweeted it out and was like, here's our heartthrob celebrity crushes and tagged those girls and Taylor and Emma didn't say anything to the other guys. And Miley like tweeted back at me and was like, I'll be your Valentine. Oh. And then like, <laughs> then like followed me. And then we like were DMing and like traded numbers and like oh. kind of, it, it was like almost kind of romantic. I mean, it was kind of romantic at the beginning and then it sort of just turned into a friendship. And I mean, we're not, we're not super close by any means, but um, she's super cool, and so I've you met her a handful of times and gone to shows. And <laughs> she's got a voice on her man. What it's about, insane um, that last album? This al last she album, she like with. can wail. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, people like you know get caught up in the other side of it, but she's got one of the best voices in the yeah. game. Is there a celebrity guy crush you could release? Oh, I mean, God, there's a lot. I I I love Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill's who I kind of go with. Who's that one? He was Superman. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, like super tall, dark, handsome. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Superman. Before we leave, Danny does a lightning round. So Danny does this quick little lightning round, Gus, and uh, you got to be like... Okay. <laughs> I have a feeling you're going to do better than anyone else at this. All right, we'll see. Are we doing it now? Yep. Okay. Okay, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, to fly. Uh, piece of advice you would give your younger self? Uh... It that it gets better. Uh, trust the people that are in your life. They're going to believe in, and stand by you, even though you think they might not believe in those relationships. And, and yeah, it gets better. Favorite UK slang word? Favorite UK slang word? Uh, snog. Um, what's the biggest difference between sports and acting? Uh... It's funny, actually. I, I think that I, I think of them as being really pretty similar in a way. Like, the one thing that sucks about acting is you have no control over it. So, like, you audition and then you don't hear back and you don't know what that's going to do. And it's kind of like skiing where, like, you do your run and then it's in the judge's hands and, like, it might not go the way you think it's going to. And you can kind of, like, work on your run, work on your tricks. But ultimately, it's a judge sport. And same with acting. Like, I, I'm in classes. You can do all these things to work on it. But at the end of the day, it's like it comes down to a casting director to put you in something or a director to pull out yeah. the most from you. 
it's not really up to you. Yeah. Like your talent isn't what's going to... It's crazy because we were talking about that last night with Succession. We think some of the characters aren't, but we're like, well, maybe that's that, That's what makes it so good. Anyway, is that your last one? Uh, mm-hmm. Favorite pump-up track. Uh, favorite pump-up track. Uh, I mean, the, the whole last Olympic cycle, I was listening to Dua Lipa's last album a lot. Whoa. Um, and I uh, also love Jesse Ware. Awesome. Nice. That's it for me, but Brittany, Sweet. do we have any more good ones from the fans? Uh, someone asked who if you have a role model or someone you look up to. I know we don't have a lot of time, but that's a good question. Uh, growing up, it was TJ Schiller, another Sick. skier, another monster athlete. Mm-hmm. He was like, he was my guy. Uh, he was the only ever monster skier, I think, that got a contract. I, do you remember that? I don't know about that. But I don't know. He, he was just the man, and he still is, um, and he coaches now, but he's a good guy. And I also, like, was the same age and really liked and, and hung out a lot with Jossie Wells, who's also a monster athlete. Yep. But he was, at the time that I started, like one of the only guys that was doing pipe, slope, and big air. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do. And so I, I definitely looked up to him a lot. And then he, he stopped competing and I kept going, but he was like, he was the man. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Well, dude, congratulations on everything. Thank you. A legendary, iconic ski career um, that just blossomed into probably something that you never even imagined, you know, a full, real triple threat of athlete actor model the whole thing dude so uh maybe we stay away from the 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 the, the tv shows they're gonna try and kill you yeah for sure <laughs> um and um best of luck with everything worthy foundation Brittany palmer as always danny cast let's give it up for gus everybody thank you so much that's a wrap thank you guys so much for having me